service. Father God, continue to touch every aspect, Father God. Continue to cover every aspect, Father God. Continue to love beyond what we think to be love. We thank you in Jesus' name.
awesome God He reigns from heaven above earth with some power and love. Our God is an awesome God. He's working it out for you. He's working it out for you. He's working it out for me. He's working. He's turning my morning into this. He's working it out for me. Come on, make it personal. He's working it out for me. Yeah. You're turning my morning into this. You're turning my morning into this. You're working it out for me. You're working it out for me. Come on, let your voice in. of the Lord God said he'll overcome it if we trade our sorrows for the joy of the Lord and so whatever you do never stop praising him never stop worshiping him if you have to offer a sacrifice of praise it must be a decision within your spirit you must do like David said I will bless the Lord at all times. I said every time, all time. Be it up, be it down, be it in, be it out. You must have resolved within your spirit that I'm going to bless the Lord because it is your praise that will push back death. Death, death, go away. Come back another day. You are my servant, not my master. You can only come when it's time for me to transition to the next place. Until then, you work for me. So I command the spirit of death that's resting on somebody right now to loose them in Jesus' name. It's by apostolic authority. No one here will die prematurely because we've got the power of praise on our lips because we've got the glory of the Lord on our lips I will bless the Lord at all times His praise shall be in my mouth glory to God so I want you to begin to praise Him right where you are in your home, sitting on the couch lying in the bed Open up your mouth and decree his lordship and tell him that I rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. God is trying to...
to stop the spirit of death. I'm telling you, I saw it in my spirit trying to creep into people's homes and creep down people's lungs and creep into people's bodies. But God said this service was designed to arrest that spirit and command it to go away. I command you to go away in the name of Jesus. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Sickness and disease be gone in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for your life. Thank you for life. Thank you for all of my days. I want you to say that. Thank you for, ask God, thank you for all of my days. All of my days. Everyone. Teach us to number our days. Okay, I'm going to number every one of them. Thank you for all of my days. I don't want to be cut short. Not one day. Not one. He told us to number our days, you know that. So that means he tells his courage us to count those days. Hallelujah. So don't you let your life go and don't just let somebody take your days from you. He says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So no disease, no sickness. Nothing is going to short circuit this life that God has given me. Hallelujah. You keep your spirit lifted. It's a merry spirit that does like medicine. It works good like medicine. So God just wanted you to take some medicine this morning and rejoice in the Lord and he'll heal your life. We're grateful to be here today. Thank you for those of you who are tuning in by live stream. Uh, share, let them know that we're here and we're going to go into the word of the Lord. But before we do so, why don't you greet your neighbor in the way that you choose to today and acknowledge them and I'm acknowledging you and I'm just so happy to see all of you. I just need you to know that God is in charge. He's on the throne. He loves every one of you so very, very, very much. Every one of you. And he is not about to lose his first battle with us. He's helped every generation. His truth endured to all generations. And he's not about to lose the battle with this final generation. No, no, no. This is going to be the greatest push from God. So I'm expecting to see him do everything that he promised. Amen. I'm going to ask if you would turn into your Bibles at this time. To the book of Philippians.
at verse number 12. Philippians chapter number 2. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have obeyed, or have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And from that text, I'm going to minister to you again on the subject of personal redemption. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your mighty hand in how you're delivering your people from level to level and from glory to glory. Thank you for what you're doing in everyone's household. Thank you for helping us overcome the difficulties of this life. Thank you for being a present help in the time of trouble, being a sure foundation that we are leaning on. I pray, oh God, that you would move in a mighty way in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The message again, personal redemption. As I've said uh, in previous weeks, personal redemption is the work of conforming the believer into the image of Jesus Christ and at the same time producing the best version of our personhood. It's important to God and it is important I think to every family to have at least one person who has experienced genuine transformation. The Bible lets us know that there will be no generation that will be without a witness of his redeeming power. And so the families that are blessed, the generations that are blessed are those that have true testimonies. Individuals whose lives have been absolutely transformed by the power of God. Because a testimony says what God does for one, he'll do for two or a million in two. But if there is a generation without a testimony, everybody say testimony, or a family without a testimony, there is no precedent. There is no open door. There is no key that unlocks that activity of God. I can tell when God is getting ready to move in a significant way in any area of the world. All I have to do is look for a testimony. Because if there's just one person God has done it through, it's an indicator that he wants to do it through everybody else that will engage. And so the families that are blessed, the generations that are blessed, are those who have people in them who are genuine, bona fide, Redeem people. I'm not referring to individuals who profess one thing and, 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 and walk another. I'm not referencing those that have great external presentation, but if you follow them home, you find another story. 
that kind of testimony does not transform. But where there is a genuine testimony, everybody say genuine testimony, it is an indicator that the move of God is about to take place in that, that, in that location. And I believe we have testimonies here today. We have individuals who have been delivered from all kinds of things through the personal redemption process. And so it is proof positive evidence that God will never forsake a place where there is a testimony. And so there are many wonderful things that take place in an individual's lives after they've experienced redemption. I want to talk about a few of them. There, there, there are at least nine effects of personal redemption. And so we just put them up here on the screen. Number one, uh, when one has completely been redeemed, they're going to experience healed memories. Number two, healed emotions. Number three, they're going to have a clear conscience. Number four, a disciplined will. Number five, they will have divine vision. They'll see themselves the way God sees them. They'll see other people the way God sees other people. And they'll see the world the way God sees the world. They'll have divine vision. They'll have what we call creative thinking. They will have a healed belief system, healed value system, and ultimately a healthy uh, life commandments. Um, these are just a few of the effects of personal redemption. Everybody say it with me, personal redemption. And so again, we have not come to church just to be a part of somebody's church. But God has brought us here to conform us into his image, to be like him so we can do the things that he was capable of doing. Um, and so I'm praying today that believers all over the world would press toward that mark. And that we would not be at ease in Zion and not just be content with being a member of somebody's church. But the best inheritance that you can give your family is a true testimony. The best legacy that you can leave even beyond dollars and cents is a life that proves what God can do. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. A life that proves that he's still a healer, that he's still a deliverer. A life that proves that he's still a way maker and all the things that we said, a testimony. And so we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our family, we owe it to the generation to allow God to transform us into what he has deemed us to be. And so I will not be a slacker at church. Say it with me. I will not be a slacker at church. Amen. And so in today's presentation, I want to focus on one particular area of the soul that we must uh, experience redemption in. Just one area. There are nine parts uh, of the soul. And you can put them on the screen. We looked at them before. There's the will, the intellect, the imagination, the emotions, the conscience, the codes, belief system, values, and memories. Nine parts of the soul. Uh, that, that require redemption, that require redemption. You can have one or two, three parts that God has worked with you on, and then the other parts may not be redeemed, and, and thus we're not doing or, or producing uh, what God is, is interested in or producing uh, that testimony that will affect change in our world. But, but all nine parts, the Holy Spirit is attempting to sanctify us wholly, our whole spirit, our whole soul, and our body uh, to be preserved blameless before the, before the coming of the Lord. And this particular message today, we're going to focus on the will, uh, which is one aspect of that redemptive process. Now, 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 now by definition, well, let me just make this statement here. Um, the person who experienced redemption in the area of their will will see some of the most dramatic changes in their life, uh, probably above any other area of the soul. When God gets a person's will under control, 
Anything that he would try to make happen in the earth is now possible uh, because he has harnessed the wheel. You know, sometimes we spend a lot of time at churches trying to cast out devils. And, and you know what I've discovered over the years that it's not difficult to cast out a devil, but the most difficult thing to do is overcome a person's will. For, for God has made us in his image and given us uh, a will that he won't violate. And certainly you cannot violate somebody's will, uh, uh, let's say, without being abusive in some kind of way. And so let's look at it. Let's talk about the will. By definition, the will is the, the and we have two points here, the human will is volition, which means freedom of choice. God has given all of us uh, the choice to either serve him or not serve him. The choice, he says, I set before you life and death. I set before you blessings and curses. Then he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Now, the reason he's given us freedom of choice is because he made us in his class. We are part of the God class. Everybody say it with me, the God class. We, 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 we dehumanize ourselves when we give up our right to choose. When we give up our right to choose, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we give away some of the dignity that God has ordained for us to have. Everybody should have a choice. It, was, it, it is what makes us like God or in the God class. And so we're going to talk about this will. So the devil will do everything in his power to dehumanize us by destroying our will. Because there are many people who live with what we call a broken will. And some people have uh, a weak will. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, individuals who were strong-willed people sometimes were uh, labeled as being rebellious or labeled as being controlling or labeled as... Uh, you know, being self-centered and self-serving. But because a person has a strong will doesn't necessarily mean that they're rebellious. Because a person has a strong will doesn't mean that they're self-serving or controlling. They can be, but it doesn't mean that that's the case. And some people have preferred what they call weak-willed people or compliant people. But a weak will and, and, and an individual that won't make decisions uh, is an indicator of sickness of will. And I'm going to show you some of these things today. What God wants in the redemption of the will is to make everybody's will strong and disciplined. For it is the only way that his purpose is ever going to take place in the earth and that we're ever going to do the things that he's called us to do. And so volition, everybody say it with me, volition. Freedom of choice. Even if we make the wrong choice, we're free to do it. And also self-determination. Everybody say it with me, self-determination. That means once a person makes a decision, then they have a determination that comes upon them. They, they, they are determined to, 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 there's a power that comes on them. We call it willpower. There's a determination that comes upon them that will cause things to happen. And when one loses that determination, it's an indicator that their will has been compromised. There are times when people say, hey, I don't have any willpower. I don't have any determination to do anything. It's an indicator that the will has been compromised. That's why you read in the scriptures over and over, David saying things like, I will bless the Lord at all times. Like we, we, we quoted that. In other words, it is an act of my Will, but a person with a compromised will will only do things like that when it is convenient and when it is favorable. So God is not trying to destroy our will. He is simply trying to heal it and harness it so that we can do the things that God has called us to do. Somebody say amen in here right now. And so I want you to look at the text today, and we're going to go into this text and begin to investigate the subject of this redemption or the redemption of the will. And I'm going to make three points today. That's all, three major sections. And then we're going to conclude uh, this message. The first section, we want to deal with personal responsibility. We want to deal with personal responsibility. 
Now, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he is admonishing them kind of sporadically throughout the book, and this is just one of his admonishments. He says, wherefore, verse 12, he says, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. So he, he gives commendation to the church. They were an obedient church. He says, but now much more in my absence. And then he makes this statement. He says, work, read with me. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So he tells the believers to work out their own Salvation. You know what he does? He makes them ultimately responsible for their salvation. Uh, the word work there deals with the, we get the English word energy from. So he says they have to exercise their own will to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Um, now, I recognize that God has given some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, etc. But ultimately, though I have a charge and though the other ministry gifts have a charge for the soul, ultimately we are not responsible for people's souls. We have a responsibility. We have a charge. And we'll have to give an account to God for that responsibility and that charge our part in it all but ultimately the person is responsible for the condition of their own soul he says you work out your own salvation it's not my salvation it's your salvation it's personal shout it's personal he says you work it out you exercise your own will to work out what God has worked in, to develop a prayer life, to seek God, to praise God. You have to decide to bless him in the morning. <laughs> you have to decide to, to decide to join this group or join that group. You know, so often we try to, to get people to do things against their will. But I've learned that if, it's not, if they're not willing to do something, it's not going to be profitable for them or for the person who's trying to get them to do it. Say willpower, willpower. And, and so he tells them to work out their own salvation. Willpower is something else. I heard a story about a six-year-old boy who was, was, was conversing with his mother. His mother watched him drop his coat on the floor. And um, she says, pick your coat up and put it on the hook. And he looked at her. And, uh, and he didn't move. And so the mother raised her voice a bit. I said, pick the coat up and put it on the hook. And the little boy looked at her and began crying. And the, the, the mother gets up and runs over to the boy and says, I'm going to teach you to be obedient to me. And da, da 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 And she picked the coat up and put it on the hook. So that was a conflict of wills. The little boy's will, energy, was saying, I ain't picking this coat up. If I have to cry, if to be silent, I'm not going to pick the coat up. And eventually the mother's will caved in. And the boy's will was supreme. So what you have there is his will producing the outcome that he had in mind. And the woman became subservient, the mama became subservient to the will of a six-year-old boy. Everything that happens in this life, ladies and gentlemen, is a battle of wills. It is the strongest will that makes things happen in this earth. It's your will. Your will is your will power. It's your energy. It's the force of your determination that makes things happen in this world. And if you don't have any force in your determination to produce then somebody else's will will cut you off. That's why no shouldn't mean no. Not to somebody with a strong will. Amen. Stop shouldn't mean stop. Not if God is telling you to do something. We have to have the ability to blow past barriers. 
And when you have a healthy, strong will, you'll know how to blow past the enemy's barriers and the things that are resisting you and stopping you. Somebody say amen. And so in this redemptive work, God is going to heal the will. So, 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 so Paul tells us here in the text, he says, work out your own salvation. Exert your will in the things of God. I know a lot of people are saying, hey, I thought salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. God is the one that brings salvation. But, it, it, but, 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 but God works things in us, but it is up to us to work these things out of us. In other words, it's up to us to apply it to the different areas of our life. You know, I can know that God loves us all and he died for us, but if I don't apply that love to me and apply the love to the relationship that I have with somebody else, then it's not going to have any impact on me. It's up to me to apply it. Say it's my responsibility. That's what Paul is trying to get us to see. And when it's your responsibility, it, is an act, it has to be a part of your will. Uh, it's my responsibility uh, to, let, let me say it this way, happiness is my responsibility. Uh, because when you make somebody else responsible for something you're responsible for, you give your power away. If you are responsible for my happiness, then my will, then I won't make any decisions, and then my determination won't be engaged, and I'll lose willpower because I've given it to you. Too many wives are, 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 have made their husbands responsible for their happiness, and too many husbands have made their wives responsible for their happiness, and too many friends have made other people responsible for their happiness, but happiness is your responsibility. Thank God for the people that love us, and husbands are supposed to please their wives, and wives are supposed to please their husbands. Thank God for the supports that God gives us, just like he gives us a five-fold ministry. But ultimately, I'm responsible for my own happiness. I'm responsible for my own state of being. I'm responsible for how I feel. You'll never hear me say, you made me mad. If I get mad, it's because I chose to get mad. You might have done some things that warrant a response, but I'm responsible for my behavior. We must never allow somebody else to take responsibility for something that God has made us responsible for because in doing so, you give your power away. Oh, somebody say amen in here. And this is why there are so many people that have weak wills because they've given their power away and they won't make decisions for themselves and they're blaming somebody else. It's the government's fault. It's the church's fault. It's my neighbor's fault. It's this generation. And though those things may factor in, but it doesn't matter if I got God on my side, ultimately, I still have a choice. That's what makes me human. I have a choice. That's what puts me in the God class. I have, I have determination. It's not what happens to me that determines what I am. It's how I respond to what happens to me. And I have a choice in how I respond to tragedy. I have a choice in how I respond to disappointment. I have a choice in how I respond to betrayal. I have a choice in how I respond to rejection. I can let it affect me or I can respond, glory to God, with the wisdom and the power and the purpose of determination and overcome. Is anybody listening to me today? Shout is my responsibility. When we embrace this truth, that it is our responsibility for our own happiness, for our own health, for our own wealth, for whatever it is, I can't defer. I got to give up deference. Deference. I got to give up deferring things to other people. They support me, but I look myself in the mirror every morning, and it's me that has to make the final call about the things of my life. And as long as I hold on to my power, my will will remain strong. 
And so don't you let the devil cheapen you and, 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 and divest you down to an animal with instinct that simply react to what everybody else is putting down in your life. Don't you descend down to the level of a common animal that has no choice. God gave you the choice to choose. It's called volition. And as long as you have choice, you can pull yourself up out of anything. You can grow. You can decide to overcome because you are a human being made in the image and the likeness of God Almighty. Now, I wish somebody right there would clap those hands and thank God for the choice. I really believe with all of my heart and I'm praying that we would take our power back. I'm my prayer today, and I know sometimes we want to shirk responsibility, and sometimes we don't feel like being responsible, but the reality is you give up your power every time you give up responsibility. These are your children, so you're ultimately responsible for raising them. The, this, that's your family. That's your house. That's your body. Those are your legs. That's your hair. That's, that's your money. That's your property. That's your mind. You're responsible for your mind. It doesn't matter what they put on TV. It's my mind. And I've got to be responsible for what I let go in and out of my mind. It's my responsibility. This is how you hold on to your power. So can we start a movement today, a, a get your power back movement? I think we need a movement. I'm praying that everybody say, I'm going to take my power back. Shout, I'm going to take my power back. And when you take your power back, you begin to heal your will. Shout, I'm taking my power back. And so the first point is, he says, you're responsible for your own Salvation. Work out your own salvation. Nobody called me, okay? Why didn't you call them? Are you listening to me? People play a strange game with themselves because they're shirking personal responsibility and they've allowed themselves to descend down to the level of an animal with instinct. And they've given up the dignity of humanity, which is the freedom of choice. Oh, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost right now. <laughs> Amen. And so he tells us there to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the second point I want to make here is called the super will. I'm going to talk about the super Will. Notice what he says in verse 13. He says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So just in case the apostle uh, thought that people believe that salvation is exclusively of them, he had to let them know it's, it's, it's your responsibility with the exception of God. In other words, he says, salvation is of the Lord because we wouldn't have anything to work out if God had not at first worked something in. So salvation is by grace. Say it's by grace. Through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. We're just responsible for working out what God has worked in. And so I have to know what's in me in order to work what's in me out of me. And it's my responsibility to know what gifts I have. It's my responsibility. Now, I get some help, some, give me some prophetic help, give me some, some counseling, give me something. But ultimately, I have to identify what's in me so I can work it out of me. I can't be at ease in Zion, a sluggard in the house of God not stewarding the mystery that he put inside of me and the purpose that he's given me because I'm upset about something. I can't ignore how great he's made us. The fact that we're fearfully and we're wonderfully made, we can't ignore that. And so he tells us it is God that does what? That works in us. Both to, watch the word, both to will and to do. 
So essentially what the text is saying is that God is working his will in our will. God takes his determination, say it, his determination, which is his will. His will is his plan. He does all things after the counsel of his own will. The book said that. So his will is his plan. And so he takes his determination and he says, I got to get my determination and my will in their will. And if I can get my will in their will, if I can get them to accept my will and my will in their will becomes one will, and then my determination and their determination becomes one determination, they will have within them the super will. The super will comprises of a man's will mixed with God's will. And a man's determination mixed with God's determination. Can you imagine what, how powerful that is? If you have your will pushing you to do some things and your determination driving you, what is it like when you feel God's determination pushing you and God's will driving you? You will be able to run through troops and you will be able to leap over walls. You'll be like a tank crushing that which is in your way. You will be unstoppable. You'll have what I call the super wheel. If you want to go to the gym, you'll just go to the gym. If that's what God has willed for you to do. If you want to learn a subject, you'll just learn the subject. Nothing will be able to stop you from doing what God has willed you to do if your will is one with his will. Because the Bible says, who can resist the will of God? Could you imagine if we could do everything that we wanted to do? The reason why we can't do it, because our human will is not strong enough. And something is stronger than our will. But if I get God's will and my will united together, there is nothing that can stop me from doing the things that God has called me to do because his will uh, cannot be resisted. It is futile to try to resist the will of God. He will get what he wants. And so he wants to, he wants to, he wants to impart that into us. But notice the terminology he uses. It is God that worketh in us. So he's got to work this will in us. He's got to get it in us some kind of way. And how do you know when God's will is in you? When you agree or when you are determined to do the things that God wants done. When you are determined. In other words, it's God's will that you be blessed. We believe that, right? So when, 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 when I decide that I, that, I, that I must be blessed, it is because God's will is worked in me. See, I can't be neutral about something that God has willed. If I'm neutral about being blessed, well, I'll be blessed if it comes. I'll be blessed if it doesn't come. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, that's a position of neutrality. And if I'm neutral, that means God hasn't worked his will in me. Because God is not neutral about you being blessed. It's his will that you be blessed. Are you here? I said it's his will. And until you have until you are just as determined to be blessed as God is determined to bless you, then his will is not in you. But when you are just as determined to be blessed as God is to bless you, then your will is one with his will and then no curse will stand in your way. That blessing will come upon your life. Somebody say amen in here. It's his will for you to be well. It's his will for you to be healed. It is his will. And, but, 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 but the healing doesn't come until he works his will in us. And, and, the, and we probably won't experience it until I decide, till I make a decision, till I invoke my will to agree with his will. So I can't be neutral about getting healed. I must decide to be healed. Because if I'm neutral, then his will is not in me. God is not neutral about healing you. He died for you to be healed. He shed blood for you to be healed. He took sickness on his body for you to be healed. It's the will of God for you to be healed. So you must decide to be 
healed because that's the will of God. And when your will is in agreement with his will, that's when that determination will come upon you to overcome all sickness and everything that's in your way. you got to decide to be blessed. You have to decide to be healed. You have to decide to overcome that thing that's bothering you. It's God's will that you be delivered from demons. It's God's will that you be delivered from a lust habit. It's God's will that you be delivered from alcoholism and from drug addiction. It's God's will that you be delivered from nightmares and night terrors and the spirit of fear. It's God's will that you be delivered from timidity. It's God's will that you be delivered from all the stuff the devil has thrown at you. It's his will, but as long as you're neutral about it, it's not in you yet. But the moment you say, I decide to be free from fear, I decide to walk in power. I decide to walk in authority. I decide that I'm going to be happy. The moment you decide to, to agree with what God decided, his will is one with your will and the power of God will hit your life. Is there anybody in here ready to make a decision? Has God worked his will in your will yet? Ladies and gentlemen, it can't happen until... Your will agrees with his will. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? Not my will, but thy will be done. The truth is, sometimes we are not in agreement with the will of God. Sometimes we're neutral. I'm telling you, we're neutral about a whole lot of things that God is, God, that God is definite about. If God is definite and we're neutral, we are not in his will. If God is definite and we are nonchalant, we are not in his will. Let, let me illustrate. Let me illustrate. If you're in a relationship with someone and, and they, are, they are casual in relationship with you, you don't feel their determination for you. They're not against you, but you don't feel their fervor for you. That what that really means is they haven't made a decision to love you yet. They're just with you. They're not trying to hurt you. They haven't made a decision to hurt you, but they haven't made a decision to love you either. See, see, you've got people in your life that you're connected to, and you don't feel any fervor towards you that you know they haven't decided yet to love you or to be with you. They're just neutral about it. And those relationships are not satisfying. If you're married to somebody that you can't feel their love, you can't feel their fervor, you can't feel them pushing with you and pushing towards you and reaching to you. If you don't feel that in their heart, it's because they haven't decided that yet. And that relationship is going to always be empty. And you're going to be saying, why didn't you do this? And why didn't you do that? And you're going to be thinking the stuff that they did. And then they'll do those things and it still won't satisfy you. Because what you're really waiting on is to feel their fervor towards you. You want to feel their determination to love you. Because they haven't made a choice, they feel like an empty vessel. They feel like something that's neutral. People who are neutral, I tell you, they'll go any kind of direction. It depends on which way the, 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 the landscape is. A neutral person ain't going to hurt nobody. They're not going to help nobody. They're going to be inconsequential. Jesus said, I'd rather you be against me or be for me. you got to put it in park. I mean, you got to put it in drive or you're going to have to put it in reverse. You can't stay in neutral forever because we don't know which way you're going to go. But if you really love somebody, you got to decide that I'm going to love you. Then your determination will touch their soul. Oh, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this house right now. Somebody shout, get out, of, get out of neutral with your praise. Get out of neutral with your walk with God. Come on, get out of neutral with your relationships with people. You're so afraid of getting hurt, so you just stay somewhere in the middle. That's lukewarm and it's nauseating. And it'll, it'll, God will spew people like that out of their mouth, and so will you. But God has called us to drive. He has called us to fall forward progress. He has called us to improvement and upward mobility, but you got to decide to grow. You have to decide to rise. You have to decide to win. And when you decide to do what God has willed to do, his power will come upon your life. It has to be agreements. Somebody shout personal redemption. 
Personal redemption deals with each part of the soul, and right now we're just talking about the will. But if God ever gets this will under his authority, then he will unlock his determination through us, and nothing will be able to stand before you. That's what he told Joshua, didn't he? He said, Joshua, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. It's because Joshua wills and God's will was one will and there was a determination that came from him that, that, that caused things to happen. And so he says, I'm trying to work in you my will. And if I ever get my will in you, then you will be willing to do and to act. An unwilling person, I told you, if they're not willing, if you ask somebody to do something, they say, ah, then don't. Because if they're not willing, it's not going to be profitable. It's not going to benefit. It's not going to hit the spot. It's not going to bring satisfaction. That's why people, when they come before the Lord in praise, they don't require a lot of, they shouldn't require a whole lot of prompting and a whole lot of begging. I don't beg people to praise God. I think I belittle God when I beg people to praise him. I may admonish it a couple of times because they may need that, but I'm not begging anybody to come to God. I'm not begging because he's too great for that. I'll present him to you and people need to choose and recognize his value. Begging someone to come to God is like begging somebody to marry uh, 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 you or something like that. Please marry me. If you got to beg somebody to marry you, then they're probably not going to treat you right. If they don't see your value from a distance, if they don't see your worth from a distance, then don't try to force nobody. Diana Ross didn't have it right when she says, I'm going to make you love me because I don't think you can make anybody love someone. They might be with you, but if they haven't decided to love you, you're never going to be satisfied with that relationship. And so the church is shifting. We're coming out of this mode where we're begging people to come to God and begging people to praise the Lord. If you don't want to praise the Lord, if you want to serve the devil, you have the choice to serve the devil. But I, as for me and my house, I've already made a decision. We're going to serve the Lord because the Lord is good. Glory to God and his mercy is everlasting. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you know him for yourself and when his will is in your will, you can't wait to praise him. The Bible says praise is waited in Zion for you. I got to praise just waiting to let out. It doesn't matter how long and how where I'm at. Something in me wants to glorify God because he's been too good to me. I wish somebody in this house right now would give him a voluntary praise, not a coerced praise, not a begging praise, but because you know him, you at home, praise him because you love him. <laughs> Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is trying to heal our will so we can use our will the right way to make stuff happen that's supposed to happen. It's a privilege to serve God. It's a privilege to minister on behalf of God. It's a privilege to sacrifice, to speak his name. Oh, I count it a privilege to stand up behind this table and talk about Jesus. He could have chose somebody else. But he called me out of darkness when I didn't know where I was going, polluted in my own blood, lost in my own mind. He chose me and I will forever tell him thank you by doing what he asked me to do because I want to be pleasing in his sight. And I'm not by myself. I know there are many others out here right now that you've got a testimony of what God has done in your life. And that's why you serve and that's why you humble yourself and that's why you praise and that's why you sacrifice because he's loved you. God is growing us up. He's not paying patty cake with the church any longer. He's saying it's time to grow up. If you love me, let me know you love me. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, show me that you love me. We're done with all that other stuff. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. And so the scripture says that he's trying to work his will in us. God has a job. God has a job. God has a job. God, who owns everything, has everything, has gotten a job. And maybe one of the most difficult things that he has to do is to try to, he gave a creature free will to hate him or love him. But he says, if I help him, I can work my will in his will. Then that man will abide in me and he can ask whatever he wills. And I'll give it to him. If, he, if I get my will in him, then I'll let him ask whatever he wills. I'll let him ask whatever he wills and then I'll, I'll make heaven respond to him. I'll make the earth respond to him. I'll make animals respond to him. I'll make people respond to him. The person that I get my will in their will, I'll cause the world to respond to what comes out of your mouth, to respond to your spirit, to respond to your authority because my will is in your will. I'll let you represent me wherever you go when our wills are united. So it's a job because it's, it's not, we don't always agree with God. We don't always agree with God. We don't always agree with God. Sometimes say, God, I ain't trying to do all of that. Sometimes we don't see ourselves as great as God sees us. Sometimes we say, God, that's not for me. But his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways, higher than the heavens uh, above the earth. And, and so I learned a long time ago that, that, that just because I don't see it, it doesn't mean that God didn't will it for me. I've got to go ahead and say, keep on working, God. That's my prayer. Keep working your will in me, God. I know sometimes I'm not in agreement, but keep working your will in me so that we can have this agreement and I can decide to do whatever you're working on in me. You've got to decide to be happy, decide to be healed, decide to be blessed. I remember when, just recently, not too long ago, I went to the doctor and uh, the um, routine checkup, EKG came back alarming again and the, uh, my doctor was all up in the air about it and sent me to a heart specialist. And uh, the heart specialist said, sir, based on what I'm looking at here, you've had a heart attack. And uh, he says... He says, he said, but looking at you and watching what you do, it contradicts what I read on the paper. He says, so I don't understand. This is a true story. The doctor said, I don't understand this because you shouldn't be able to do what you do with what this thing says on paper. And then the, the heart specialist said, either your heart has performed its own bypass. Or you're just a mystery. He gave me two options. He said, either you're a mystery that we don't understand, or your heart has performed its own bypass. And uh, he says, so he wants me to become a subject for his learning. I'm a wonder to him. So he wants, he wants to probe and poke and study to find out how can you do what you're doing when the EKG says that? I said, Doc, I don't understand it either. All I know is he's all over me and he's keeping me alive. I used to hear this mother sing that song years ago. He's keeping me alive. He's keeping me alive. He's all over me and he's keeping me alive. Jesus is keeping me alive. I know some of y'all don't know that song, but we used to have an old mother used to sing that song on Sundays. And every now and then I'll wake up in the morning and I'll hear it in my spirit. He's all over me. And he's keeping me alive. 
keeping me alive, keeping me alive. He's all over me and he's keeping me alive. Jesus is keeping me alive. So I agreed. I said, okay, Doc, I'm going to let you work your mystery. I'm going to let you find some things out so you can figure out what's going on. But I need to know I'm a man of prayer. I told him I'm a man of prayer now. And uh, I'm ultimately responsible for my health. I thank you for what you do. I want to hear your recommendations. And I want to hear all of your hypothesis and your prognosis and all of that. But ultimately... I'm responsible, Doc. You're not in charge. I'm not going to take that because you say take that. I'm not going to do that because you say do that. I've got another physician that i got to refer to because he's the one that says with his stripes, you are healed. And so I decide to be healed. Are you hearing me? I decide to be well. Even if the test won't show it, my body is what God said it is because that's the word of the Lord. Are you listening to me? you got to make up in your mind that you're coming into an agreement with the will of God and there is nothing that can defy the will of God Almighty. That's true stuff I just shared with you. Let me hurry here. When God works his will in you, nothing can stop. The person that's in agreement with the will of God. You have what, we, what, the, what I'm calling the super will. The super will will be emerged within you, which is the fusion of your will and God's will. Your determination and God's determination is the super will. And I believe that God is raising up people with the super will to blow through stuff that's going to happen in 2021. They're going to say, how you make it through that? I got the super wheel at work in my life. Glory to God. How are you going to make it through that? I'll plow through it because I've got the super wheel at work. And my wheel has been redeemed. My wheel is strong. My wheel is resolute and, and is not doing what I want to do. He's worked his plan in my will. So I'm only willing to do the things that he has planned. And that's a strong disciplined wheel. I'm not afraid to make decisions based on what God has put in me. I'll decide to do what he's agreed to do. And you have to make a decision. And a decision is not just something in your head. A decision is a position of the heart. You have the purpose in your heart. A decision, a true decision is a position. If you make a decision one day and then you change your mind the next day, that was not a real decision. That was your head just talking back and forth. But a real decision is a position of the heart. The word decide is compound word. The, the, the suffix is side, which means scission or to cut. To side is to kill, scission. Suicide is to kill the self. Homicide is to kill a man. Genocide is to kill a people. Pesticide is to kill pests and animals. And to decide is to kill every other option in your life. You have not made a decision until you are killing every other option. I don't have a plan B. All I have is what he said. Somebody said you need a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. Maybe you do. But I, when he works his will in you, all I got is one plan. And that is the will of God for my life. When you really make a decision, there are no other options on the table. So you can't go back and forth on a real decision. When your will is healed, you make real decisions. And you stand with them. Regardless of what the storm and the winds blow, you stand with it because you've killed all the other options. And your determination will get you through even those areas. Now you got to make right decisions. You don't want to stand with something wrong. You make a wrong decision, then you need to acknowledge it was a bad decision and then change that decision. Choose to change it. Don't be stubborn now when you know the decision is bad. But in my closing, let me hurry here. In my closing, uh, I want you to see this. The third point that I want to make. So the first point is my responsibility. The second point is the super will. And the third and final point is leverage. Because the question is, how does God get his will in our will? How does he work it in there? He, he uses leverage is what he does. He, 
God is smart. He uses leverage. What do you mean, preacher, leverage? Well, there are people who said, I would never do that. And I would never do that. And they made a decision of something they would never do. But uh, money got tight. And somebody offered them some money to do some things that was against their will. And so their need or desire for the money was stronger than their decision. And somebody used their money as leverage. There was an individual that was blackmailed before. You know, he was blackmailed. Listen, I need you to be quiet and don't say that again or I'm going to expose you. And so leverage here, I'm going to expose you, so shut up. And you can change people's wills by leverage. You can work your will in them by using some form of leverage. Are you hearing me? Uh, politicians deal with it all the time. They may have a desire to pass a bill in a certain area, and they say, well, we'll, we'll pass your bill if you accept this. Now, the this is something you hate. But they say, I'm going to use this as leverage. I'm going to get this in if they want that. So people start compromising because of leverage. Are you listening to me? People do that all the time in every place as they're negotiating and they're getting people to do things that people don't necessarily want to do. Some people give up their babies and give their daughters over to folks because they're getting something back. And when they get sober, they say they can't believe they did that. But they'll somebody use leverage to make it happen. Are you tracking with me? Well, God uses leverage in a good way. God will... Uh, this is a true story. I knew an individual who was having problems in his sexuality and uh, he was doing things that he didn't want to do or that he said he wanted to stop, but he could not stop. And then the thing that he was doing happened to somebody very close to him, one of his close relatives, and, and it broke his heart and it made him hate that sin. He didn't hate it while he was doing it, but he hated it when it happened to somebody he loved when he became a victim of it. And God says, can you hear me now? That's leverage. God says, I tried to tell you when you were doing it, but now I had to let you feel the effects of it through somebody else that you love. And all I want to know is, can you hear me now? He says, I hear you, God. God used that to work his will in him. Are you listening to me? There are many things that God is trying to work in our lives that if we don't get it from preaching and if we don't get it from studying, then he'll use a situation in your life and he'll say, if you don't, uh, there's another story, somebody who, who used to be very dishonorable to everybody, dishonorable to the church, dishonorable to a whole lot of people, and they didn't believe in honoring folks, and you don't, that's worshiping men, and they, they were just dishonorable people. But then their child grew up and began to dishonor them. And all of a sudden, they start preaching honor. Now you got a revelation of honor when you want it coming to you. But when you were dishonorable, you didn't have a revelation. And God says, can you hear me now? And so when it happens to them, they can hear all of a sudden. And God will work his will. So however God has to get his will in your life, if you don't get it through the priest's word, he's going to use some situation in your life. And he's going to say, can you hear me now? There are people who have never been in certain positions. And, and, and they've never been pastors. And they have things to say about pastors without ever being in a position. So God will let them get in the position and let the stuff they did to others happen to them. And he'll say, can you hear me now? He has a way of getting his truth <laughs> in people's hearts. He's going to work it in and he's going to use, everybody say, leverage. And so I would rather just say yes. But I want truth so bad. I want his will so bad. If you have to use leverage to get it in me. Use leverage as long as you get that truth in me. And the outcome will be the birth of the super will. Anytime the truth is in you, you become one of the most powerful people. Or, or his will is in you, one of the most powerful people. Because, because the truth is, without his will, everybody gets tired. Everybody gets tired. That's why Paul acknowledged people or admonished people in one area to, to be not weary in well-doing. For in due season, he says, you will reap if you faint not. The tendency to faint is real. And there are a lot of people watching my live stream today that are weary with what's going on in the world. Weary with the coronavirus. Weary with isolation. Weary with not being able to go to church. And weary with missing Thanksgiving with relatives. And people just want to end this thing. Weary with the troubles of this life. But if you're not careful, your weariness 
will cause you to feel so overwhelmed that you give your power away. And you say, it's the world's fault that I'm losing my determination. And I don't have the desire to even get up and wash my face in the morning because the world is so messed up. But you're weary. When you're tired, that means your will has abated. And I'm not talking about physical fatigue. I'm talking about a different kind of fatigue. There was a time when I got tired with pastoring. I've been pastoring 36 years, maybe longer than that, something like that. And I hit a spot in there and I was weary, not physically tired. I was weary with responsibility. I was weary with pushing forward and fighting and all of that stuff. I was weary with that. And the Lord taught me something. He says, listen, son, your will is getting weak. And as long as your will is weak, eventually you're going to be overcome. He says, but, but, but he said, what does the scripture say? But wait on the Lord. Again, uh, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And then I'm going to strengthen your heart. So what does that mean? When you wait on the Lord and he tells you to be of good courage, courage is a strong will. Courage is a strong will. Anytime you're encouraging somebody, what you're doing is you're lending them your determination. When they're weak in their will and you're strong in yours, they can feed off of your strength and it can strengthen their will. That's why we have to learn how to encourage people because we're living in a time where a lot of people's wills are weak because of what they're facing in this life. But those of you that are strong in your will, you have to encourage the weak people. How do you do it? It's not just what you say. It's the strength of your determination. When they see you're strong, they'll feed off of that. And that will strengthen them. That's why the text says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And the Lord will strengthen your heart. And so if you don't have anybody around you strong, you have to learn how to wait on the Lord. Because the Lord is always strong in his determination. And he will strengthen your will. In another place he says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not get weary. They shall run and not faint. If you wait on the Lord, he says, even the young man will get weary and the youth will utterly fall. And so the only way to make it today is you got to wait on God. You have to decide that you're going to lay before the Lord sometimes. You got to decide that you're going to pray all night until you feel the strength of his will. I know what I'm talking about. I've gone into prayer with a weak will and come out like a lion. Are you hearing me? But it's because of his will has strengthened my will. And if I can't get God to do it right away, I need to find somebody strong. Everybody can't be weak. Are you hearing me? Everybody can't give their strength away and be depleted. You, your, weak, your will becomes weak when you use it. Because it, it's, like, it's like a muscle. The more you use it, you deplete it. You make too many decisions in one day, you will feel weak in your will. And you'll need somebody to strengthen you. That's why when Jesus went into the wilderness and fought those demons, the angels had to come and strengthen him when it's over. No shame in saying, I need strength. There's some folks right now that need strength. But God told me to tell you, this is a season where he's going to strengthen you. We're turning the pages right now. God says, I'm getting ready to comfort you. I'm going to walk alongside you. I'm getting ready to patch you up. I'm going to strengthen you so you can be encouraged. Don't you, don't you get so discouraged that you quit. This ain't the time to quit because there's, there's a future God has planned for you. There, there, there's something coming on the horizon that's going to bless your life. So I need you to hang in there. I need you to be strong. I need you to be of good courage. I need you to wait on the Lord. I need you to keep praising God. And before you're done, your will is going to get stronger and stronger. Before you know it, you're going to feel like preaching again. Before you know it, you're going to feel like serving again. You, you, I know right Right now you're on the side of the road but if you just wait long enough God will resurrect you God will lift you up again I dare you to give him praise right now until you feel the strength and the power of the Lord God Almighty be encouraged somebody trouble don't last always weeping may endure for a night but joy is gonna come in the morning we're coming out of this pandemic we're not going to die. We're going to live. We're going to overcome these diseases. Our home is going to have peace. We're going to get our money back. Things are going to turn around for us 
because we're the children of the Lord. We are his people. We are his people, his elect, his chosen, his bride. He will look out for us because he said, if you don't take care of your own house, you're worse than an infidel. And God's going to take care of his own house. You are the house of God. He's looking out for you. He knows your life by day. He knows your life by night. I dare you to trust him right now with all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. He will strengthen your heart. He will pick you up again. He will hold you in the hollow of his hand. He's your God. He's your God too. He's not just my God. He's not just the preacher's God. He's your God too. Claim him for yourself. Say he's my God and with God all things are possible. With God I can overcome anything. With God I shall win. Worship his name. Worship his name. Hallelujah. God, we give you praise today. Our life is in your hands. Because you live, we can face tomorrow. Because you live, all fear is gone. Because I know you hold the future. Life is worth living just because you live. Those of you watching by live stream, I need you to know everything is going to be okay. Keep your hand in the hand of God. Keep your hand in the hand of God and exert your will to praise him. Exert your will to seek him. Exert your will to connect with strong believers. This is the time to connect with strong people so you can be encouraged. Don't stay discouraged by yourself. Call somebody up and just say, I need to hear your spirit. If your spirit is low, call somebody up and say, will you just talk to me, preach to me for five minutes and release your spirit on me and your strength will lift my spirit. Thank you, Father. I believe God. I believe God for you to be healed. Those of you struggling with heart disease, may the Lord heal your heart like he keeps doing great things for me. I rebuke the spirit of death off of you now. Go in the name of the Lord. May the Lord heal your body. Whatever's ailing you, decide to be healed. Because it is the will of God. If I had a question God's will, I would have been in trouble a long time ago. But when it comes to me getting healed, it is, it is a definite thing. It's not, I will not be in neutral about my health. I'm not going to be in neutral about anything that I know God wants. If God is determined to see it, then I'm determined to see it. I believe in the church. He says he's going to have a glorious church. So I don't care how people act. I'm determined to see a glorious church. Because that's the will of God. Praise is what I do. It's what I do. Open your spirit and say, praise is what I do. Praise is what I do.
the chat room. Say, let me be a part. There are people there that are going to help you. You need prayer. Tell them you need prayer. You can send your prayer requests to the church. We get them. And we will pray for you. And if you need personal help, reach out. Reach out. Somebody's here to help you. We are concerned about you. You don't have to die. You don't have to remain in sin. You can be delivered. Come on, join the E-Church. Become a part. Exert your will and do it. Decide. Give your life over to Jesus. Do what you need to do. Those of you supporting this ministry, continue to support this ministry. Sow your tithes. Sow your offering. We need your support. We love you very much. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord give you peace. God bless you and bye-bye for now. Were you blessed by today's message? Do you think others need to hear this message? Share today's service on your social media pages. Like and subscribe to share. Give your tithes and offerings online through Givelify or Simply Said. Links are provided on the Embassy website at embassycovenant.church forward slash give, or you can give on the Givelify mobile app. Search Embassy Covenant Church International. Be sure to follow us on Facebook at Embassy Metro Detroit on Instagram at Embassy Covenant Church, and on YouTube at Embassy Covenant. Thank you for joining E-Church at Embassy Covenant. I'm sure and I trust God has really blessed your life and the Spirit of the Lord has lifted you in some way that only He can do. Know that we are in your corner. We have your back. We will continue to pray for you, and God will never fail you. The best is yet to come. See you next week. Thank you.